with your restaurant, you're a chef. Uh, I'm sure you've worked incredibly, incredibly hard to make it as safe as possible. Um, what do you fear if lockdown restrictions come in? What would the impact be to you? Well, we have worked tremendously hard to create COVID safe environments where people can come and enjoy food and being in an, in an environment where they feel safe. And that's borne out by our, our, our social media, our, our uh, reviews. It's now become the number one thing that people comment on is how safe they feel. The tables are well distanced, everybody wears masks, we sanitise, uh, the cutlery is sealed. It's all of these things. We have extra people on duty to make sure that everybody is adhering to the regulations. So for us, we are already operating on restricted hours. We have a restricted menu and we still have staff from furlough. To be in this position and then be told that tonight at six o'clock, we have to shut the doors and not be able to trade for 16 days, although we will be trying to do a takeout. But all we're doing by takeout is minimizing the loss. That potentially means that our restaurant could not open again. Now, I'm determined that that won't happen, but there will be some restaurants that this will be the coup de grace. They're already struggling, and this will be the final blow. Do you understand the argument from those that say there's a risk, um, and in where we've seen numbers of cases rising so sharply that this is an appropriate response to the risk? For instance, have anybody, as far as you know, caught COVID in and around your restaurant? Do you see clusters of people leaving your restaurant and think, oh, they're not social distancing. You know, can you get the argument? I do totally get the argument, but we are incredibly careful. But one of my problems is we're all been lumped in together. There's no uh, distinction between bars and restaurants. Bars, you tend to go to drink. That's one social activity. Restaurants, you tend to go to eat. That's a different activity. And I have seen scenes of people uh, congregating outside bars and restaurants, clearly breaching guidelines, and it makes me absolutely furious because these guys are engendering the, uh, the safety and the well-being and the future of our staff. Now, I, I genuinely believe that we can't have full lockdown because that will cause economic lockdown, but we can't have full let it loose. This bug is not going away. We need to learn to live with it and we need to learn to okay. be sensible and we need to learn to police it ourselves. Well, let's talk to Professor Gabriel Scali mm -hmm. about this because, of course, this, this group, uh, Professor Scali, of public health experts suggesting we should try to build up herd immunity will be gaining all sorts of interest from people up and down the country. There has been some serious lockdown restrictions put on in various towns in the north of England and we've seen that that has had very little, if any, impact on the COVID rates that are going up. Uh, the strategy certainly doesn't seem to be working at the moment and it, all it is doing is, is harming the economic situation and the mental health of lots of people around the country. How do you assuage those people and that growing consensus that feels like the government is going about this in the wrong way? Well, I, I think the government is going about it in the wrong way, not because of uh, their intention to put on more restrictions. The rate the virus is rising at and the way in which people are now starting to come into hospitals in numbers shows we need to do something and more restriction is about the only tool in the box that we have at the moment. But, the more but, we put, but more restrictions the most... have been placed on a number of those towns in the north yes. of the UK and it hasn't had any impact whatsoever. Well, indeed, and for some of those places in the north at the end of the last lockdown, the uh, virus was still spreading endemically. It, it didn't go away there and uh, it came back very, very rapidly. So why would further but restrictions the problem, help not, then? The problem is not our restrictions. We need to get away from just thinking about restrictions. The serious problem is to get a very good system of fine test, trace, isolate and support in place. And that's what we don't have. And it's what really works and has worked in other countries in Europe, uh, Germany being the best example, but there are plenty of other uh, countries that have done it really well. And we've done it really badly. And the NHS test and trace, or so-called NHS test and trace, has just delivered its worst performance since it was started. So that's where the failure is. Mm. And it's because of that failure to put that in place that we are seeing this upsurge in cases. So it isn't all about restriction. It has to be a, a, a really determined effort to restructure that issue, that whole testing and tracing problem and uh, get the virus under control. And we and there are fringe experts, I, I, I agree, but they are the fringe of the fringe 
who are saying that it should run free, and that would be a complete and absolute disaster for the country. Why? Well, just explain why. I think we all can have a guess why. Okay. But why, why do you feel like herd immunity isn't the solution or aiming for herd immunity? Well, I, I, at, at the moment, about less than 10% of people have been exposed to the virus in the UK. To get to herd immunity, and it's never been tried before, this is a unique experiment that they are advocating, and a dangerous one, is to uh, artificially, in fact, some are saying we should have, uh, there's a duty on young people to go out and get the virus and spread the virus. When you think of all the death and destruction that we've had from less than 10% of the population exposed, what would happen if 40 or 50% of the uh, population got the virus? Their, their strategy is based upon protecting those at the highest risk. Well, how do we do that? I don't know of any country that's managed to have high levels of virus and keep it out of hospitals or care homes or, or people's domestic, uh, people's homes when they're getting care provided to them in the home. And the final thing about it is that they never mention long COVID. And we now have growing numbers of people who are just not recovering from the mm. infection and may well be disabled for, for the foreseeable future, if not the rest of their lives. It's far too dangerous. It is reckless okay. beyond belief well, to advocate such a strategy. Let's come to Isabel on this then, because Isabel, you firmly believe that the strategy isn't working. I think everybody's ag agreeing with that. But as Professor Scally's saying, further restrictions aren't the answer. It's test and trace that has really let us down. What are your thoughts on this? Are you, are you an advocate for herd immunity? Well, I mean, I have to take up uh, what Professor Scali was saying there about so-called fringe experts uh, favouring letting the virus run loose. I think that is uh, grossly insulting to the 15,000 scientists and medics from Oxford, from Stanford, from Harvard, some of the most distinguished medical experts in the world who now favour a policy of targeted protection, focused protection. So this isn't about letting the virus rip as uh, people rather hysterically term it. It is about much more targeted uh, support for those who need to shield the most vulnerable and otherwise letting the rest of people, the vast majority of people who are not very, very seriously affected by coronavirus, get on with their lives. Let's put these uh, statistics in context. The average age of a COVID death is 82. 82, that is older than average life expectancy. Hospital admissions at the moment remain an absolute fraction of the number of beds taken up. And at the moment, coronavirus associated deaths are not even in the top 10 of causes of death. 300 people a day die of cancer. And I don't see us shutting down the entire economy for that. OK, well, let's put that to Dr Hillary, because I know that we've talked about this privately, Hillary, haven't we, about sort of those sort of statistics. And it's, it's a, it, when you write them down and when Isabel highlights, highlights them like that, there'll be a lot of people this morning saying, that doesn't sound right. Is that really the situation? What's your reaction? Well, she's, she's not listening to Professor Scully. He's just correctly pointed out that only a minority of people have ever been exposed to COVID-19. In the first lockdown, over 52,000 deaths, probably 60,000 deaths uh, as a result of COVID-19. And she wants to open up the, the, the whole of the UK to COVID-19. You can't protect in a focused way the vulnerable and the elderly. You can't. It didn't work in Sweden. hasn't worked anywhere in the world. And if we just say, oh, let it run riot, we will have a, an overwhelmed NHS. We'll have ITU beds full of COVID-19. We've only exposed a minority of our population to COVID-19 just now. And young people can get this too. And many people can get long COVID symptoms for many months afterwards. This can be a very serious illness. Look at what's happened in the BAME communities. Look what happened to NHS staff. Many died from COVID-19, many of them under the age of 40. We see this sometimes rarely, albeit in babies and children. And to let it run riot is reckless. I agree with Professor Scully completely. Do you think maybe one of the reasons why you believe is about that the, the lockdowns haven't worked is actually because often in the places where they've been imposed, people haven't followed them. So it's not the locking down that hasn't worked, it's the obeying the rules. 
Well, I think people have lost faith in the government's approach to this, and many people now feel that they will take their own decisions about what is a sensible level of risk to take. And I would just like to take Dr. Hillary up on the statistic that he wheeled out there. He said many people under the age of 40 have died of coronavirus. In fact, the number of people under the age of 60 without any underlying health conditions that have died of coronavirus or with some associated coronavirus on their death certificate is in the region of 300. 300 deaths out of a population of 66 yeah, because million. Because only a few yeah. people have yet been exposed. Did you not hear that bit? Only a few people have been exposed to COVID-19. Probably 20% of the population, not even that. It still is the case. So you, you, that multiply the vast... it, you multiply it by the other 80%, and you've got thousands of deaths in young people. The vast majority of people who are exposed to coronavirus do not die of coronavirus and are not hospitalised with coronavirus. No. So, look, can it be right that we are sacrificing a young generation of people, that students are imprisoned in their halls of residence, that mental health toll is rising? that the Daily Mail today on their front page brilliantly highlights there are now 110,000 people who are waiting more than a year for hospital treatment. Do you think that's right? No, you've got to run... You've got run I've always said you've got to run both together. If, you, if, the, if the NHS becomes overwhelmed with patients of any age with COVID-19, they cannot see patients with cancer, heart disease, cataract that's surgery that's needed, hip... But you've got to do both together and you've got to manage them carefully. And if you open up COVID-19 to the whole population, no-one is going to get treatment for anything else. Let's the go to NHS Professor is Sir, no Isabel. Just for, sorry, Isabel, we're running out of time and, and we have let you speak for a while. Let's, let's go to Professor Scally quickly before then we'll come to Nick just before we finish. Professor Scally? Could I just make one really important point? The uh, fringe experts who are advocating this strategy talk about protecting the, a small proportion of the population at highest risk. But there are millions and millions and millions of people who are at moderate risk. Maybe they have very bad asthma or they have some cardiac problem or they have diabetes or some other underlying condition. And millions of people have that. And if you expose all those people to COVID-19 and they get infected, no, they don't have a huge risk of dying, but they have a moderate risk of dying. But millions of people exposed with a moderate risk will turn into tens of thousands more deaths. Tens and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. It is a bonkers policy. OK, Nick, let's come back to you just for the last last comment, Thank because you. as I think Kate, Kate said at the start, I mean, you're at the heart. Your business is at the heart of this, your livelihood, yeah. the people you what employ. What I object to, we, we, we do need some kind of restrictions. I've, I've watched the, the entire population passing through uh, retail environments, supermarkets, uh, very lightly regulated, uh, going on public transport, going to hairdress. In the restaurant industry, we take this seriously. Why are we being picked on? Why are we being chucked under the wheels of the bus for the failings in other environments? And the statistics do not say that the majority of these new COVID cases are coming from people who are meeting in a restaurant situation. Pub situation might be different. You need to set to those out. We need to have an environmental health agency that is able to go into premises and say, this is, these guys are doing a good job. They can have a COVID safe environment. These guys, less so. We are going to have to learn to this, live with this virus. 